thank you for coming for our section today. Um, we will start now. Uh, my name is Robert Mo. I'm currently the solution architect at Evolving Web. And this is my uh, co worker. Sorry, yeah. I'll try my best. Uh, my name is Brian Kay. I'm a UX UI designer at Evolving Web, and I love design systems. Uh, we come from Evolving Web. Evolving Web is a full service uh, web agency. Uh, we're based in Montreal, Canada. So we drove all the way from Montreal to New Jersey the day before. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> and um, uh, we, we work mostly with the public and private sector in Canada. We also work with some uh, higher education, many university websites. And here are some of our clients. So this is one website we did for the Ministry of Tourism in Quebec, uh, building the beautiful website for travel. So whenever you come to Quebec, please check it out. It's beautiful. And this is another example. We work for the Ontario College of Art and Design, um, so for the uh, university. <clears throat> and this is um, another project we did for uh, Beneva, which is one of the largest insurance company in Quebec. So uh, let's start today's session. Right, so some of the topics that we're going to be talking about is introduction to design systems, and then from a design point of view, what's happening in Figma with variants and variables. Uh, Robert will be talking about uh, how to implement the theming in Drupal, component libraries, and then we'll get to some questions. Uh, can I have one point here? So the topic that we want to conduct in here it actually very large. It's the full workflow from designing something zero to one up until the end where you implement everything into Drupal and then you QA it. So because it's so large, so today with 45 minutes, we cannot, uh, we cannot keep you in here for three days. So only 45 minutes, we will try to scratch the surface. Uh, but uh, basically that is the impression of how it looks like everything worked together. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so starting at design. So you might be wondering, you might have different levels of familiarity of what is a design system. So according to Nielsen Norman Group, which is the UX designer bible, it's a complete set of standards intended to manage design at scale using reusable components and patterns. So sounds simple enough, sounds manageable enough. I think a lot of people when they hear design systems think of really beautiful type scales or color swatches and really aesthetic things that we put into Dribbble. But for me, uh, design systems really represent bridging design and development for, for scalable consistency across different platforms uh, to create a unified user experience. So we're benefiting design, development, the company, as well as the end users. Design systems really require designers and developers to communicate a lot. Design systems cannot be done in a vacuum. Uh, I can't just spend my day playing around in Figma and expect it to wind up in the code base. I need to collaborate with the developers. I think a really po important point to consider with design systems is that this is meant to be iterative. It's not like a project that you're going to start, finish, put on the shelf, and never look at again. It's a living, breathing thing that you're going to be maintaining throughout its life cycle. So one quote, uh, speaking to the collaboration from Lori Kaplan at Atlassian, Atlassian. Um, it wasn't hard to get designers to follow the guidelines, it was hard to get them to agree on the guidelines. So just, there's a strong emphasis that I'd like to underline here for collaborative communication. So now we might ask ourselves, what does a design system do? So some of the problems that design systems can help answer or help to solve would be to organize and unify your UI elements, your buttons, your input fields, all of this. It can also help to reduce redundancies. Uh, one company I was at before, I did a component audit and found 47 different buttons, 47 different variations of what could have been one button. So we can try to reduce or can, yeah. <laughs> it was fun, it was a lot of fun. Uh, so we can... <laughs> So we can try to reduce uh, that level of com unnecessary complexity. Uh, design systems can also help to enforce and strengthen brand consistency um, and brand vision and values. And it's also, they can be a great investment uh, to save on future resources. 
actually, um, this is we are talking about the futures, the actual futures, because uh, implementing it and maintaining it is something that is very resource con consuming. So if your project is not, uh, maybe your project will not be fit into building a design system. You don't need it or not. So we need to, dis uh, it depends. If it is big enough, yes, maybe uh, you, it work to invest resource into building it and maintain it because that is much more work than building a normal Drupal website. Exactly. So now we all know what a design system is, what it can do. You might ask yourself, do I need a design system? And if you've got a small website, maybe a few pages or a landing page, the answer might be no. It might be overkill, it might not be the right fit. If you've got, like we do at Evolving Web, we do a lot of higher education websites where there's many, many pages, a lot of different user journeys, a lot of uh, branded moments and elements. This could be a good opportunity to bring in a design system. So a really high overview of what that would look like as for a brand or maybe a product is to create and define a library of atomic design principles, which I'll get into in a second, and then applying those values uh, to your library of components that you can easily scale um, and create consistency with, and then reusing those components across page one, page two, page three, etc. Another opportunity to introduce a design system uh, would be like a current project I'm working on, Evolving Web, in which there's one overarching brand and inside of that, there's 14 different programs and 14 different sub-brands. And in these programs, each one of them has their own unique branded personality uh, and so wants to have its own look and feel, but we want to manage this at scale. We want to be able to manage all these components across all of these programs and across all these brands. So this would be a great opportunity, I think, to incorporate a design system, which would follow the same basic principles of following your atomic design, uh, be it with your typography, color, and whatnot, applying that to your library of components, and then just swapping out your colors for your specific brand uh, websites, your brand colors and logos, and then reusing that across site one, site two, site three, site 14. So where do we start? So, like I mentioned, uh, if you Google design systems, cool. Uh, you're not, it's not going to take you a long time to find atomic design if you Google design systems. Uh, this is something brought forward by Robert Frost and it's sort of uh, the concept of going, starting small to go big. So we start at the subatomic level with colors, radii, width, padding, stroke, etc. And then from there I can sort of build on if I have a background color, a border radius, a border color. This is something that can start taking the shape of an input field. If I add some typography, a label, uh, padding in between my label and input fields, I'm getting a molecule that's taking the shape of something I can give to the users. If I start building on this uh, and start stacking input fields and buttons, we're starting to see something that we might uh, be familiar with. And if I want to standardize that uh, into a template that I reuse across all pages, we're using everything from the subatomic level that'll remain consistent throughout every component or every template that we'll be using. And in the context of Drupal theming, atomic design has been something that we have been doing in the last few years using either Pattern Lab or we are using UI Pattern, but those are the contrib module. But with Drupal 10, we have SDC, which is a single directory component with a new way to theming in Drupal. So we can do atomic design theming inside Drupal core without the need of adding any contrib module. We will talk more about the SDC in the next part of the session. So as a designer, I spend a huge percentage of my time in Figma. Uh, and in Figma, I'll be starting out with variables, like I used it before. Uh, so what are variables? Variables are Figma's answer to design tokens, if that rings a bell for anyone. It's Figma's, it's Figma's answer to subatomic values. So variables can reference color, stroke, width, radii, padding, border, etc. I don't think I've gone a single project without using padding variables. And so what does, okay, what does that look like once you get into Figma? I open up my variable panel, looks like this. And then here is my primitive 
layer. This is the starting ground for where I'm going to start declaring all of my values. So in this case, I've got my colors. Uh, so I've got color primary, uh, and 100 is going to reference a hex code. 200, a different hex code, and these key value pairs. Uh, so for designers and for developers, I start at 100, lightest, and then in my case, I go to 800 being the darkest, uh, referencing this uh, in this way. So this is really uh, scalable, it's fast, it's easy to maintain, and it's particularly easy to switch brand colors. So if I want, I've got one brand now, I can add another brand that has different uh, primary colors, and then I can just switch between those easily. If I go one level further, uh, now I've got my color modes. So I start with my variants, then my color modes. Uh, two of the ones that I use the most often would be uh, my background primaries. So you can see I've got my colors for text, border, foreground, background. And my uh, background primary references color base white, which I declared in my variables. Uh, my background brand solid references color as primary 600, again, which I declared in my variable level. All right, so what does this look like in a component? So everyone's favorite example, buttons, uh, this button, all buttons, uh, have a bunch of variables nested within them. In this case, a radius, space between icon and text, uh, padding left, right, top, bottom, color for background, border, text, and foreground. So all of my little green circles, uh, you can show, you can see anywhere that you see in Figma in this panel, a little gray box, that's an instance of a variable. Uh, so this is where, this is where all the fun stuff happens. And so then as a designer, if I come in and I want to start applying or using these variables. I've got my button, and I click into my stroke. Uh, this could pull up a hex code, but I don't want to use that because it's not scalable. I can't reuse that. It's a lot of copy-pasting. So I'm instituting my variables. And so now I click into my stroke, and here, in the little pop-up, all the possible color variations that I have declared previously in my variables are available to me now. So I click into stroke, see all the possible options. So that means that I, as someone who's been working on this project for three months or someone as a new designer, can come in and see uh, human readable variable names such as button secondary border, button, button secondary border hover as my possible border options. Um, just another sort of example to see uh, would be spacing. For my image card, I've got my image and my content. In this case, I've got my spacing 2XL, uh, my t-shirt sizing I'm using, again, more like human-readable variable names to reference 20-pixel padding. So what does that look like for a component? Again, if I have my image card and I start with a spacing medium, which references six pixels, going to spacing 4XL, referencing 24 pixels, uh, this is just one little switch over for me in my variable panel to give the button a little bit more breathe, or to give the image card a little bit more breathing room. Uh, so why this is beneficial for designers? Uh, before, I would have to do a lot more manual work, um, maybe create a spreadsheet for different spacing that I'm using. Here, it's just one click of a button to uh, have consistency across all components. If I do this at the component level, it will affect every single instance of the component that I've declared. All right, so how can I manage different kinds of components? Uh, in Figma, uh, we have variants. And variants, uh, according to Figma, uh, introduce a new way to group and organize versions of the same component. Uh, so we combine variants into single components with custom properties and values. For example, with my image card, I might have two different variants, such as vertical and horizontal, uh, or maybe mobile or desktop, or different types, uh, such as event, article, or info. Another example that showcases uh, how many variants and how we can manage variants in Figma would be buttons. Again, in one of the projects I'm working on now, I frequently, most frequently, use my primary and secondary gray. So this is an opportunity for me to define uh, my mobile and desktop versions, my different states for default, hover, focus, inactive, or active. Um, 
And so this is just two examples, but if we zoom out, this is actually the amount of variance that I'm using for my buttons. I want to jump in here and uh, say, there is a funny discussion in between uh, Brian and me uh, when talking about the variant, because the variant for designer in Figma is one thing, but the variant for the developer in SDC context is totally different. In SDC, the variant is like a, a different uh, var a different component that looks similar but slightly different, where in Figma it can have different meaning. So we encourage the discussion, the communication in between designer and developer, because some, sometimes the same term can be different in different contexts. Uh, so this is an example that uh, we want to present. This is a hero uh, component that we implement in our project. Uh, it's a paragraph named hero, and it's very simple. We have image, we have, uh, we have title, subtitle, text, and link. And at the beginning, uh, when we implement it in Drupal teaming, uh, creating one component for this hero, everything is simple, everything is smooth. We define those um, attributes, and that's it. And uh, after a while, we uh, did a marketing come in and say, we have a new product, a hero. We need a new component with paragraph hero with table or something. And it looks slightly different. And it has, uh, the, it has um, a new pro project attribute in the table you can see, and it has the horizon. But the other attributes are still the same. So uh, that kind of uh, discussion, that kind of scenario, that will happen a lot when we build and maintain a component library. Uh, our job is to, uh, to, to do a lot of communication to find the middle crowd of it. We don't want to turn one single component to be a monster with so many attributes in there to fit with all the scenario. But we also don't want to copy one component over and over and duplicate the code because it would be very hard to maintain. So we talk a lot to find a common ground and we find some solution to, uh, to come with, with the, the best um, solution case by case in that, like that. Exactly, so we're not trying to create uh, as many variables, or variants rather, as possible. So some ways that we can uh, limit our variants is to look for redundancies. Is there any way, any place that we can consolidate uh, into, single into fewer variants or single components? Uh, as well, talking to developers and your team members about what would constitute a new variant or a new component. I think also planning for edge cases. If I'm designing, again, an image card that I know is going to have call to action items, I can try to think ahead, like, what would that look like if it had pills or badges in it so that I can accommodate for that in the future? I think another important thing for designers to remember is uh, to kill your darlings, even though it's really easy to get attached to all of your beautiful, precious little components. Maybe we don't always need all of them, so we can try to be mindful of how many variants uh, we're using. And another way to sort of manage uh, the amount of variants that we're using is through naming conventions. Now, this has been a large, fun discussion at our internal project at Evolving Web. Uh, I think some of the things that I've learned the most um, about naming conventions is it's important to get buy-in uh, from your designers, from your developers. Anyone that's going to be getting their hands on it and using it needs to be aware of what is it called and agreeing more or less on what we are calling it. Uh, it's also really important to consider future, pro future proofing your component naming, uh, trying to plan for what things are going to be used in five months from now, five years from now. Uh, it's important to think of naming things for their function and not just their context. So for example, if we had one instance of a component that was called blog postcard, I know that no one in my design team is going to be looking for a component called blog postcard because we don't work with that very often. By switching into image card, that has a little bit more flexibility. And again, aligning with developers. Yeah, uh, we as a programmer, we all know that uh, naming something is very hard. So basically, we just move everything to the designer to decide. Because actually, it, that makes sense. Because in the, in the workflow that we define, the developer is actually at the end of the pipeline, at the end of the workflow. And if Brian come to me and say, I want to team up the um, teaser, the block teaser, for sure that I will name it like card block teaser. And, but, but what if in, in, in Brian, 
uh, Maya, she wants to use the same look and feel of that component for the news release. She wants to use for the news release. So at that point, using card block teaser for the news release doesn't make any sense anymore. So, and she has a broader vision on the component library landscape. So I think that makes sense to shift it to the designer to make that decision. But we also have some input from the developer as well. Yeah, I think that's really important part to emphasize, as well as developers obviously have typically more experience in naming things and naming things for more impactful purposes. So again, a great place where communication is important. Um, so again, coming back to Figma, where I spend most of my time, some of the sort of challenges or things that I've come across uh, doing design systems in Figma. Uh, thinking about variables, variables were just released, I think, in May or June of last year. So there's still a lot that's being developed, and there's still a lot that's unsupported, uh, such as typography, typography, typography. Uh, they don't support textiles at all yet. I think they probably will soon. But that can be, if you are creating a design system, that can be a challenge for some people if textiles are not supported in variables yet. Uh, gradient and opacity fills, images are also not supported, uh, as well as independent values. And so if I want to have a border, I can have that. But if I want to have only the underline of a border, that independent value is not yet supported. Uh, other issues uh, in Figma that we've come across is nested frame linking. So when I'm trying to hand something over to developers and give them a link to the frame of a component I'm working on that hasn't been very stable, um, I'm sure Figma's working on it. Uh, as well as libraries, you can publish Figma libraries so you can use it across different projects. This is something I've advocated for a lot in the past, but recently we have found some bugs in it, so just things to consider. Uh, other, another issue that I think Figma gets criticized for a lot is its lack of smooth dev handover. Currently there are some uh, user-built plugins or extensions to send the variables over to devs. So yeah, hopefully in config that'll be addressed soon. And so yeah, sort of stepping back for a second and looking where I start in Figma, I declare my variables uh, with my brand colors, uh, declare them as variables with my primitives and semantic layers. <coughs> then that information is transmitted uh, through JSON file, which can be applied to SAS, to CSS, or whatever cool new technology people are using. And this is, I think, so great and so powerful because we could be using this for iOS, for Android, for web. It's completely tech agnostic, and then it'll be applied to site one, site two, site three, with the same look and feel everywhere. Yeah, so actually Brienne wants to build a design system that will fit with different scenarios like React, Vue, iOS, for example. But that might be too big. And let's go back to the context of today, which is the Drupal teaming. So before going into Drupal teaming with SDC, I want to talk about the Tailwind. Uh, so Tailwind uh, is a CSS framework that, <coughs> that we use for uh, pretty much all of our Drupal project now. Uh, before we use uh, Material UI, we use Bootstrap CSS. Each of them have uh, advantage and disadvantage. And we found that Tailwind with Tailwind, it comes with a set of very powerful CSS utility class in CSS, so that we can build component in a very flexible way without the need of writing raw CSS. And the second part is Tailwind come up come with a file name Tailwind.config.js. Uh, which is the play, the single place where we can define some uh, design token in there. Something like primary button will be associated with a hex value like this and like that, which fit really well with the concept that Brian mentioned before, which means everything that she exports from Figma, we can somehow translate it into Tailwind and then make it work with our teaming system. So just to... Uh, a very quick demo here. So on the left hand side we have the vari variable.json which is uh, the JSON that we export directly from Figma. It looks like this. It come up with uh, a bunch of uh, sub-object, color primary and red with the raw value like this. On the right hand side it's a very minimal setup for Tailwind and as you can see the part where we extend color it looks similar. We have primary color associated 100 with the hex value. So it means if we write a very simple JavaScript function, we can basically translate what we have from Figma into Tailwind config. And then after that, 
in our Drupal teaming, we can use all the Tailwind utility class. How does it look like in action? So uh, next we go to the part where we talk about single directory component. So single directory component is um, basically um, a one single uh, folder where you define on the look and feel of that component. Let's go into the example for uh, it will be easier. So this is the card, the, the simple card that we, we talked about in the previous part. As a developer, when I receive it from Brian, I will just basically analyze what we need in this component. We need an image, we need a text, we need a title, and then we need a link. The link can be a bit more complex because it will be a text and a URL. So having, a, having that in mind, I can start writing the SDC. So the SDC component, uh, th this is a very minimal version of an SDC. On the left, we have a YAML file where we define the input structure of the data that we want to, to put into the SDC. On the right-hand side will be the twig file where we define the markup of the component. And as you can see on the left, uh, at the, uh, the property, we can see uh, image URL, which is a string, title, text, link, URL, and text, which is exactly what we, uh, we highlight on the previous slide, how we analyze the component, when we analyze the component. On the right-hand side, it's just the markup. There are a few things that I want to highlight. For example, we have the border gray 200. So this is a Tailwind component. So border gray 200 is associated with a hex value that we define in the Tailwind config.js, which means we don't need to worry about what is the hex value look like, or if in the future, if in a sub brand we want to change the gray value to be slightly darker, go back to the tailwind config.js, change it, and it will be applied in here in this component. And everywhere we use that class. The, uh, there is another thing which is, um, uh, we can see that there is a div with a class P5. P5 is the spacing in tailwind. P5 is correspondent to padding uh, 1.25 RAM, correspondent to 20 pixel. So, that is also, uh, the spacing system is also configured in the tailwind.config.js. Um, if for some reason, uh, for that branding, the padding want to be a bit bigger than that, we can change it in the config, it will be applied everywhere. Same concept. And uh, the last one that we need to highlight in here is the reusable of uh, component. So atomic design that Priya mentioned before, highlight the fact that we can reuse component. And with SDC, it is very easy. You can just reuse the CL Tailwind link, which is another component that we define in another place in this card. We don't need to worry about adding the specific class to make it look like we want. And if we configure everything like that, then the output of the SDC will look like this. It come up with all the markup that we need, and we can see here um, there is the CL Tailwind link, which is the uh, the button over here. This is the part where we uh, embed the link uh, FTC. It will automatically render the markup that we need like that. And another thing that I, I, I use quite a lot, which is the data component ID, which we can see on the top, the data component ID CL Tailwind card, and then the data component ID CL Tailwind link. So that is the uh, something that comes uh, with the SDC. Uh, that uh, the CL Tailwind is the name of the team or the name of the module where we have on the component. And next, the card and the link is the name of the SDC component. This is useful in the way that we can see which component we are talking about for debugging purpose. And this is also very useful when we do automate testing, which we will discuss in the next part, because it can serve as a selector where you can use it to write on the test scenario. So, uh, so next we need to talk about the component evolution. Like Brian mentioned, uh, component library is not something that you can build and then put it on the shell and that's it. It's a living, breathing thing. Yeah. So it will keep evolving, it keep changing over time. So the question is, how do we manage it? How do we keep it in our hand and not turning into something that we cannot control? So this is a, an example of a component that has been evolved over time. At the beginning, it has. <clears throat> at the beginning, we have the, 
this is a hero, a very simple version of hero. We have uh, the title, we have the tag, we have the CTA button. And at some point we say we need an image in there and then we have a new variant. At some point we say that some of this few can be optional. You Maybe you don't need the tag in there, maybe you don't need the CTA in there. So a component can, over time, can add up more variant in there. So the question is how do we uh, control how do we manage on those variant without causing regression? Uh, we use a tool named uh, Storybook. Uh, so Storybook, uh, in, in one phrase uh, introduction, this is a JavaScript framework that serves to visualize the component. Uh, Storybook is very popular in React and Vue because they use it to visualize component. In Drupal, uh, we use uh, Storybook uh, because with SDC, there's the module name uh, CL Server, which is um, uh, the, the first version. And now we have the, another module name, uh, Drupal Storybook, uh, which help us to visualize the SDC component that we define inside, outside of the context of Drupal. So what does it mean? This is how the uh, Storybook look like. This is the UI. and you can see that um, we are talking about the component named Hero Small, and the highlight part on the left hand it's saying without image, and the right part is the component itself. Without image is the story that we write for this specific component because we want to see how it looks like when we don't have image, and then we can write another uh, story where the component have an image. So this means we can easily see. Without image, it look like that. With image, it look like this. And then we can spot right away that, OK, there is some problem with the padding between the text and the image, I mean, which means when we change something, we can go back to the storybook and quickly go through all the story that we write and see if it caused any problem or not. So that, that helps us to have a, a global view on the current the existing uh, variant so that we can do the decision on whether to extend the existing component or we build a new one. <clears throat> so, uh, and having, uh, when we have the global view on the landscape of the current state of the component library, that can help us to, get, to make some decision in the development of the SDC. Uh, so go back to the example of the hero component that we have. Uh, this is the first version, and then this is the second version. And then I talk to Brian and say, OK, this is the only two hero that we will have. Uh, so maybe we don't need to create a new component. But if we, if we add a new attribute for the proj and project and add another attribute for the horizon, does it make sense? And actually, there's another way to do that, and another clever way to do that with SDC, which is using a slot. Uh, so SDC, you are, uh, let's come. Let's go to that. So when we when we when we put two component uh, side by side together, we have a Brienne because she has all the design. So we can highlight. There's only different, which is the highlight part in here. All the rest are very much similar. All the structure are the same. So we define to build it into a slot. So what is a slot in SDC? SDC is a black box and then you fit it with the input, which is, which is the structure of the data. And the output will be the markup of the component. We don't know how, it's look, how, it, um, how it works inside that box. But sometimes we will need to change a few parts of that black box to tweak the output. So how do, you, how do we do that? We define a slot. In this case, um, I will not go into how we actually define it into SDC because we don't have much time. But this is the actual implementation. And we can see that uh, this is the hero component. And in the block content, in this case, I only <coughs> need to print out the few text. And in the second uh, hero component, in the block content, I can add a bit more complex markup to create the column for, for the table. This means we, we, we don't need to create the second component. Less component to do is mean less work to maintain. And uh, we still have the flexibility to adapt with all the scenario that we, we want to build. <clears throat> and so that is the first part about SDC. Everything 
used to be quite simple when we build, when we work on a new project, when we build everything from scratch, we define the structure and then we test it. There's less regression uh, to manage, but that is not the case of all the project. And sometimes we work on a legacy project that has been built for several years, and uh, it has been built with the classic uh, Drupal teaming way. You put everything in the paragraph template, no template, or block template, and uh, we think that slowly turning it into SDC will help us to not only manage on the component, but also reduce the regression. In the future, if we change something, we only need to change in the component. We don't need to go into each and every template that use it to change it. So uh, in order to solve those problems, we have a few solutions. One of the thing is, we uh, do continuous integration and continuous testing. Uh, we work in a sprint. Uh, so at the end of the sprint, then we have a deployment. After the deployment, we need to make sure that all the changes that we introduce during the sprint will not cause any regression. And for the case of uh, working with component with design system like this, what we care about is the behavior and the visual of that component. Behavior in, in, in which way, like, <clears throat> I work in a project where in the homepage, uh, we, if you come from Ontario, we will show a different product. And if you come from Quebec, we will show a different product. So we want to write a test case uh, to imitate a person coming from Ontario and verify the product is right or not, and another person coming from Quebec to verify the product. And it will not be sustainable to do it manually, so we write it. Uh, as a scenario to test. You can write it in, uh, we use Playwright, we use Cypress, uh, and write those uh, scenario. And then whenever we deploy the CI, uh, kick in and run through it and every scenario and verify everything. So that is for the behavior testing. And uh, we also use the visual testing. Visual testing is like before the deployment, it will take a screenshot of that page. And after the deployment, we take another screenshot and compare them pixel by pixel. So if you change the color, it will spot it right away. If you shift it one by one pixel, it will spot it right away. And uh, uh, to, in order to do the visual regression test, we, we use a tool named Percy. Uh, Percy is a tool from browser stack. Uh, it's, um, it's very easy to integrate in the CI system. So how it looks like, this is the dashboard of Percy, and on the left we can see that um, there's the previous version before the deployment. On the right we have the, uh, the, the new version after the deployment, and we can spot it right away that there's some regression on the margin top of the, uh, the heading, and uh, the font size is a bit uh, bigger. So in this case, that, uh, that kind of scenario, we can either uh, approve it if it is the change that we expect, or we can come back and verify it and then make another push, CI kick in, and then retest everything. <clears throat> and so that is for the CI CD testing. Uh, another another um, uh, small solution that we implement is uh, sometime in the website that we build, uh, we build with Paragraph in this case, uh, there are hundreds of instances of that Paragraph. And if we introduce SDC into the template of that paragraph at once, it will be applied to 100 of instance at once. And what if we forget some edge case in there? What if we uh, forget a case and that, that will cause some problem displaying in that, uh, that instance only? So we uh, come up with a, a, a simple solution using paragraph behavior, uh, which will add a checkbox in, in, in the paragraph um, in the paragraph form, and uh, to to tell, I want to render this in, instant using SDC. And in the Twig file, we basically conditionally select either to render using the traditional template or to use the new SDC. Uh, that way, uh, from time to time, we can just go over each and every instant and verify that everything is good. When all of them are switch into, into SDC. As you can see, we have the, the dashboard, the small dashboard here, it say uh, one on 211 instance has been switched into SDC, and we approve that. 
if it is go up to 100%, we will go back to the tweak file and then just do the cleanup. And then now our Paragraph templates will only have the SDC component. And from that point forward, everything will be much easier to manage, much easier to, to, to test and, and QA. So uh, there, I'm sure that there are other solutions to manage this kind of scenario, but this is one of the example of what we can do, conditional rendering. So, all right. So, to summarize in general, if you are going to create and maintain a design system, some takeaways could be to start small, uh, be that for dev or design and your components, whatever. Uh, start small, build out. Uh, also, to do continuous audits. Where are there? Where is there room for improvement? Uh, where can you add to? Where can you subtract from? Uh, as well as. Document everything. Uh, documentation is really important for design systems if you want to ensure its future success. Uh, one tool that I've had a lot of fun and success with for documentation is Zero Height. It's a place in which uh, you can have your design and your code and your use cases uh, exist in the same place. So there's Figma embeds. So these are my primary and secondary buttons, uh, which is the live version of what exists in Figma. You can also have your storybook integration with your code snippets and then your maybe do's and don'ts for use cases for designers, when to use a primary button, when to use a secondary button. So this is basically the, <clears throat> the landscape of our workflow. Um, the designer basically work on the horizontal row. Uh, so Brian will work with Figma, Zero Hey, and sometimes she will need to check the uh, storybook to see what is the current state of the component library. The developer will work in the vertical way. We build the SDC, we build the component library, and we put everything in the st uh, storybook so that Brian can see it. So this is our proposed workflow. And that, that's it for our session today. Thank you. And before we go into the question and answer, I would like to say that we are organizing the Yvonne Drupal in Atlanta in April 12. And uh, Evolving Web is offering some training in there. And, and one thing is we are offering the SDC and Tailwind CSS. So if you want to discuss more about SDC and Tailwind in depth, Please come to us. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, questions? Yes, please. You mentioned the first key that you use to use uh, for visual testing. Is that a separate thing? Sorry, I cannot hear you. First key, you mentioned a tool that you use for visual testing. Yeah. Is that a scripting language? Uh, so the question is whether Percy is a scripting language or something. Yeah. Uh, no, actually, Percy is a, 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 a product from a browser stack. Uh, so it come up with a dashboard. It come up with an API key that you can use to integrate into the CI system. And the way that it works is whenever we, we let's say we 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 we, we tell that these are the page that we want to do the visual regression test. When it's run, it will send those URL to Percy. Percy, Percy we have a cloud service where it run and check and take the screenshot of those image and then compare previous version. And then you can go into the dashboard Percy to see the different, like the screenshot that I show there. You can approve it or not. Yeah. No, no, no my question is, um do you have to script it to do that, or is it like a report in paper? Oh, uh, yes, we do. We need to do some configuration to, to, to do that. We need to write some JavaScript to do that, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the way that we set up is we uh, set up proceed together with Playwright. Playwright is the testing tool that we use for behavior testing. Playwright. Playwright, uh, let me come back to the slide over here. So we use a Playwright. Playwright is an end-to-end -end testing tool, uh, I think, fun by Microsoft. Uh, with Playwright, we write a test scenario using either JavaScript or TypeScript. Uh, we can write something, go into that page, click on that button. And then when we merge it with Percy, we can say, 
take, use proceed to take screenshot of that page in that stage. Yeah, so that is how it's work. Any? Uh, so, yes. is that is that is that testing in different browsers? Uh, like, you know, because say there's uh, differences between say like Chrome and um, uh, I don't even know the Microsoft one or um, Safari. So, does it does it take into consideration the different browsers as far as the testing uh, in the playwright? Yes. So the question is whether. Uh, Percy can test on different browser. Uh, yes, it does support a different browser. By default, out of the box, it will support Firefox, uh, Chrome, and Safari. And you can configure to test it on different viewport as well. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Any questions? Hmm? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Repeat the question. Oh, yeah. Um, have we experimented with Figma dev mode? Yes, we've started doing that quite recently uh, and started weighing the values of having dev mode or um, just edit, just read access or view access, or we're starting to have some of our developers also have um, broader access where they can access more things. Um, yeah, it's a big question that we're thinking about right now. Okay. Yeah. We can yeah it's sort of charging more, so a lot more, yeah. <laughs> like a lot more, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So that's good. So thank you for coming today. <laughs>